Ladies and gentlemen, friends and scholars, it is my great pleasure to introduce again Professor Catherine North to deliver the third Priscilla Kincaid Smith Oration on Health titled Precision Medicine, the Future is Now. This oration honors the life and work of Professor Priscilla Kincaid Smith, so I would first like to acknowledge and welcome Priscilla Kincaid Smith's daughter, Jackie Fairley, and her husband, Ian Fraser, who are with us today. Welcome to you. The first woman professor at the University of Melbourne, Priscilla Kincaid Smith is perhaps most famous for her demonstration of the links between the headache powders that used to be used then and used to contain phenacetin. And she was the one to actually recognize the relationship between those powders and kidney cancer. But she didn't just stop there. Upon making this discovery, she campaigned strongly against the use of these powders and got them in the end eliminated from common use. She was also the first woman to be elected president of the Royal Australasian College of Physicians. Priscilla Kincaid Smith was a strong role model and mentor for women in science and medicine. And as a very powerful voice for reason, she served the governments in many capacity, serving as the chair of the Ministerial Advisory Committee on AIDS in the latter part of her career. And I think it is fitting then that we have chosen Professor Catherine North to give the third oration. She is the director of the Murdoch Children's Research Institute and the David Danks Professor of Child Health Research at the University of Melbourne. She is, as we noted, one of Australia's leading and most influential physician scientists. And quite like Priscilla Kincaid Smith, she has used her science to make a difference, led important and influential organizations, served government and society. So please join me in welcoming Professor Catherine North to the podium. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you to everyone for the amazing honor I've received today. Um, I'm now coming up to five years here in Melbourne, and uh, I must say this is such a wonderful collegiate an outstanding health and med medical research community. And it's a real honor for me um, now to be a, a really truly part of the University of Melbourne to be honored by a degree. Um, so I'm, I'm very grateful for that. Um, as you've heard, rather a lengthy <laughs> dissertation, um, I have spent a lot of the last five years, um, but actually a lot of my career, uh, working in genetic disorders. And many of you will have heard the term precision medicine, personalised medicine. Um, it's, it's actually quite hackneyed. Um, but what I really wanted to talk to you about today is where we're up to, how we've got there, and to really think about this great potential for the future. Um, for me, my background is in um, child health, in neurology, um, but most relevant to this in genetics. And this is the most exciting time to be a, a geneticist, um, to, say true to see true transformation to our healthcare system. So this is an overview of what I'll be talking about. I am going to give you my personal perspective. I was asked earlier um, how long it took me to, to prepare this talk, and I, I just went a lifetime, um, because it really is um, where we are now uh, and where I am now in, uh, in this part of my career um, really relates to a lot of experience across a lot of areas along the way. So I'm going to tell you about the olden days. I'm going to tell you about what's happening on the global scene, um, and then I'm going to tell you what's happening right here, right now. So let's start with the olden days. Let's go back, way back to 2012. Um, I, I, but we'll go back before that. Um, my training and my interest in research has been in kids that have inherited muscle disorders, and you will have heard of muscular dystrophies, for example. And all of these kids present in a similar way with muscle weakness. Um, many never gain the ability to walk or they lose the ability to walk. Uh, it affects their muscles of breathing, and many of these kids die of respiratory respiratory failure, and it can also involve the muscles of the heart and heart failure. So very disabling, often early onset disorders. And when I returned from my training in Boston um, and, and back to, uh, to Sydney, I set up a neurogenetics clinic and a neuromuscular service to focus on this group of disorders. Now, the oldie diagnostic flowchart, again, this is the 2012, 
um, really meant that when we saw a patient presenting um, with neuromuscular weakness, um, we'd go through our clinical, most essential, the clinical assessment, family history. We'd always take a, a muscle biopsy. If you'd ruled out Duchenne muscular dystrophy, for example, you went to a muscle biopsy. And then a whole range of protein, um, protein studies and then you'd actually start to pick the genes you thought were involved and you'd sequence them one by one. And that was really what we have been doing um, for the last 20 years up to 2012. Um, my favourite group of disorders were the congenital myopathies. And you must agree, muscle is beautiful. Um, and nothing gives me greater pleasure um, than to look at muscle down a microscope. Um, but sadly, and also happily, uh, it's getting past the time where we actually need to do these invasive muscle biopsies. And I'm going to focus on this disorder here, nemaline myopathy, and just tell you the story of, of a couple of kids that really illustrate this issue. When I started my, my research lab in this area in 1996, um, we had one gene for nemaline myopathy, one other gene, and nil else. But by the process of the Yoldi diagnostic flowchart and lo looking at genes and linkage one by one by one, by 2012, we'd actually filled in um, a fair bit of this table, and we were very, very proud of that, but it was long and painstaking work. Nemaline myopathy, as I've mentioned, is characterised, Nema is Greek for thread, and what you can see here in the muscle fibres is that they contain these little wormy thread-like inclusions. And this is a, a, the classical picture. You see this facial weakness. They often have respiratory insufficiency and need um, ventilation at night. They can't feed. They need gastric feeding um, and delayed walking. And nemaline myopathy is a disorder of this part of the muscle contractile apparatus, or the sarcomere. And as we learned more and more about it, we realised it was actually a disorder of the thin filaments which contain actin. So you would have heard of actin and myosin in muscle. At least you have Mark. So this is Eliza. And I first met Eliza in about 2004. And she was in the intensive care unit because she couldn't breathe on her own. She couldn't swallow by herself. And she spent nine first nine months of her life um, under support in a neonatal intensive care unit. Um, but we did know at this stage, because of big studies that we had done of hundreds of kids with nemaline myopathy, is that if you could get them through the first two years of life, they'd be able to walk and they would live. But if you couldn't, they, they, would, they would die of respiratory failure. So this is Eliza, um, and this was about four years of age. She first walked independently about seven years of age. Always troubled by this facial weakness. She's actually a bright kid. She, she decided she wanted to learn French and Japanese, but she had to lift up a chin to be able to pronounce anything because of the weakness in her jaw muscle. So we did lots of investigations using the olden ways um, to look for a cause for Eliza's, um, for Eliza's muscle weakness. And over the years, we did extensive protein studies to try and find what was abnormal. We sequenced all of these genes as they were being discovered. So it seems not like not a lot, but we'd discover it, a gene would be discovered and then we'd look for it to see if it was the gene. Nebulin um, is a gene that at the time I actually got permission to send Eliza's DNA to America where it was going to cost me $8,000 American to sequence the one nebulin gene. Um, and, but at that stage, even though we had no genetic diagnosis, and even though there might be a one in four risk, the parents said, we had ELISA by in vitro fertilization, we've got one more stored embryo, and whether you told us that baby would be affected or not, we want to go and try and have that child, because it's our last chance of having a baby. And so they said, we, we won't spend that money on that test, and it turned out that um, we were able to exclude Nebulin anyway. And they went ahead and they had another baby. And they had Sarah. Now, you don't need to be an expert to tell that Sarah has exactly the same disorder as Eliza. Um, they both have this extreme weakness and delay. They're both ventilated at night. They both need tube feeding. Having two disabled kids is a tremendous um, stressor on the family and the parents eventually broke up um, because of you know this constant care constantly having to be in hospital for the care of these kids so we were at the stage you know that is the tragedy with these severe disorders if you can't come up with a diagnosis and you can't give parents um, assuredness about the future um, then there's a lot of chance taking that happens 
Now, it was at this stage, around 2011, 2012, um, that the, we became very heavily involved in this next phase, this genome sequencing. Um, and initially, we did it in collaboration with, I'm very proud to say, two of my ex PhD students, Daniel MacArthur and Monkel Leck, who are based at the Broad Institute. And it's when the PhD students give back to their supervisors, to those of you who've got your awards today. That's what these guys did. They said, Catherine, we want to sequence all of your unknown muscle cases. God bless them. And so what we were getting to at this stage was that sequencing was high throughput, it was rapid. And certainly what we've seen and why we're seeing this revolution about personalised healthcare is sequencing the genome or all of the genes at once is becoming quicker and cheaper. And we're actually now at the point where we can, we can do turnaround um, in you know, two to four days and we can do it at a cost of one to $2,000 depending on how complex it is. So here we were in 2012, Eliza and Sarah, this family were the number one in our um, search for new genes in this collaboration with the Broad Institute. And it was really one of those dream stories. We got a top hit, we get long lists of possible genes, um, but one of the first things that came up was this compound um, variant in this gene called Elmod3. And we were able to confirm that it was in both siblings, it was the parents were carriers, I won't go into the detail. Um, and although no human disease was associated with this gene, when we looked at the literature, and I'm just, all I want you to pay attention to here is we had a biological plausibility, which means that by understanding the disease mechanism of this disease, which we did, we knew it involved the actin thin filament and the known genes involved this actin thin filament, then you saw this gene is an actin filament nucleator. So we just thought, I just thought I would eat my hat if this, is, <laughs> not this one, if this is not the gene. So, to prove this is a disease gene, in the olden days what we did is we emailed our mates. And I remember sitting and you've got some mates that you really, really trust and you tell them exactly what the gene is and ask them to screen their families. And then you've got the ones that you don't trust quite so much and you sort of tell them the vague chromosome and the first letter and sort of get them to have a look and say. Um, but by doing um, that, we were able to screen within a six month period over 540 additional cases of nemaline myopathy from our mates around the world. And we identified an additional 17 patients to really prove that this is a major cause of nemaline myopathy. Um, this is just a list of the families. And what you can see is this unit's you know, very severe, but you can also see the international collaboration for this rare disease. We had to go far and wide to find a lot of these cases. What we did find is that this is a, a cause of the very severe um, and often lethal form of nemaline myopathy. Um, and we saw the common features, but all patients had quite severe weakness, um, were unable to breathe, difficulties feeding. And in actual fact, of all the babies we found around the world, Eliza and Sarah were the only two that had survived. All the others had died in the newborn period. And I don't think that was because of our super duper, well, I think we did give super duper care, but, um, what we did eventually find is that the mutations that they had, they still produced some of the protein. It wasn't completely gone compared to the other cases. Then you have to prove that how it causes the disease. So we did a whole range of things, but you know, the most interesting is that we made a fish um, that actually has this mutation. And these fish, as you can see, you can see the spots they actually form the rods in the muscle and when you poke them with a, um, the head of a pin, they didn't move as quickly. Um, and so they had the, both the motor deficits and the muscle abnormalities. So this exome sequencing, this genomic sequencing, this ability to sequence all the genes at once quickly. And when you think of that one nebulin gene for $8,000 US versus all of the genes for $2,000, um, it's, it's a bargain bonanza. And over that next three years using this technology with our you know, thousands of kids with undiagnosed disease, um, these were the first 180 that we did and you could see we've now solved 90% of these cases and 75%, this is sort of, the, the figures are really, um, really quite exceptional compared to less than 10% as it was four years ago. And at the same time, the cost has been coming down and down. 
So we are now in the era of genomic medicine where it's a no-brainer that if I see a patient with a neuromuscular disease and I can do a genetic test and screen all of the 500 different genes that can cause neuromuscular disease, that I shouldn't be bringing the kid into hospital, giving them a general anaesthetic and doing a muscle biopsy because it's invasive, it's expensive, and I'm much. this should be my test of first choice. So when I moved to Melbourne, and thought to myself, we'd been doing everything based on philanthropy and research grants. I must say the, the one thing in my mind is how do we get this paid for in the health system? How can we make this freely available? And we're not there yet, but I, I think we're getting there in terms of making this sort of technology available where it needs to be. And that will change over time. Because it's certainly, I've shown you, it can give faster and improved diagnosis and we can predict more for the future, and in increasing cases, we can intervene and we can prevent. In cancer in particular, it's a real basis for really targeted therapies based on genetic abnormalities. And certainly going into the future, um, we all are a mixture of our genes and our environment, and being able to predict your risk um, and aim to get you to behave in better ways um, to, to improve your future health or to be able to target drugs that are specific to your disorder or, or your health, um, I, I think is the promise of this. So meanwhile, what has been happening around the world? And again, let's go back to 2013. Now at this stage, and again, you'll remember we started working with the Broad around 2012 in a research setting and the Broad has sort of been leading the way. But what, we were then, what was then found, and this was from a meeting convened by Francis Collins, who's head of NIH, but also led the sequencing of the Human Genome Project, is that we are generating now, both in research and starting to, in clinical practice, um, generate uh, genetic, uh, genetic sequence from millions of samples. And so our challenge is how do we share that data for good? Because basically, if I've got a rare disease, like you know, we found 19 cases around the world and we're you know, slowly finding more of the same disease as ELISA and Sarah, we really need data on millions of patients and to be able to find other cases, um, but also to be able to make predictions for an individual. So the problem we're facing is that, you know, I've got all my data in my lab on my server and all my specimens in my cupboard and, you know, I share data with my mates by email. Um, we need to get past that and we need to make this data freely available. To give another example, if you're a person um, that has no family history of breast cancer and you have your breast cancer gene sequenced, if you find um, a a change or spelling mistake in that gene or a spelling change. What you want to know as an individual, is that benign? Is it a normal variant? Because we all vary between each other. Is it a change that's been associated with disease? Now, if it's a change that's been associated with disease, is it associated with cancer 5% of the time or 95% of the time? That's known as the penetrance. Because you're going to use that decision for you to decide whether to get a preventative mastectomy. And you want that information to be as accurate as possible. And it's really by pulling data on hundreds of thousands or millions of people that we can actually make accurate predictions for an individual. So the Global Alliance was formed after this meeting called by Francis Collins in 2013. And its goal is to accelerate progress in human health by sharing responsibly um, data. And it's based, the work is based on a 1948 Human Bill of Rights that says it is a basic human right to benefit from advances in health and medical research. So it's looking at benefit while also taking into account risk. It now involves over 500 organisations around the country and it's supported um, very much by NIH, the Wellcome Trust, the Broad Institute, um, and many other organisations. So this is an example. This is my one example of the work of the Global Alliance. Now, I emailed my mates to find other patients that might have a change in the LMOD3 gene or that had a severe phenotype or the severe clinical features of nemaline myopathy. Um, but now what we're doing, and this is one of the first things I pushed for in the Global Alliance, is that there are many databases around the world that link genetic information and clinical information, so genotype, phenotype databases, but they're all sitting separately. 
So we've developed Matchmaker Exchange, which is a way of federating um, the data in all of these different databases. So you as a researcher or a clinician can sit at your computer, type in LMOD3, and it pings all of these databases around the world and gives you a match. So that it's a very fast way of emailing your mates and people you've never even met to make contact to start to look. And this is now working very well and it's driving many gene discoveries. So the Global Alliance approach, um, which we're also adopting here, because I'm about to get to write in right now, is don't reinvent the wheel. Actually build from what exists, the existing databases, make them work better, make them talk to each other. Be practical. You're not going to overlay a big super system. You need to build from what exists and you need to gauge the wonderful experts that we have um, all around the world as well as all around this country. And from a data perspective, we need to embrace federation, which we already do luckily in Australia, is that you're really bringing the analysis to the data. Um, and by that, you're able to use and aggregate data from millions of people. So I've just come back from um, the plenary of the Global Alliance where we announced our strategic plan that we've been working on for the next five years. And I, I'm just going to, this was what is the world going to look like in five years' time? And I've really just highlighted what I wanted you to take from this is that we've been doing a lot of stuff in research, but over the next five years and now we're going to be generating millions, tens of millions um, of genome sequences uh, in healthcare. And is our healthcare system ready for that? So the Majas, the, we want the data to be accessible. <clears throat> we want the health, healthcare system to have electronic medical records that are linked with genomic data um, so that we can really interrogate and have a learning healthcare system. Um, and we need to do that in a collaborative effort so that we are pooling data with all of our colleagues around the world um, so that we're linked in with our mates automatically rather than just emailing our mates. And we need to engage politically to make this sustainable. This needs to be something that is of value to our government because it's going to transform the way our healthcare system um, performs. So everyone thinks about sequencing, but sequencing is now sort of getting cheaper, it's much more routine. It's all these different pieces, bits and pieces within our healthcare system um, that we need to bring together so that this flows seamlessly. Um, so this is really about a whole of system change, and many of you here will have experienced or been part of the work that we've done with the Melbourne Genomics Health Alliance, um, which was really a, was a self-funded pilot study starting back in 2013, um, where seven institutions put in 250,000 each to run a pilot project to say, wouldn't it be great if we could get the data from the Royal Children's Hospital to talk to the Royal Melbourne Hospital and that we had interoperable standards between all of our diagnostic labs and they were all able to talk to each other? And that was the basis of Melbourne Genomics. So right here, right now, where are we up to? Our Australian healthcare system is where we have to start. We have to work within this system. We have federal and state um, health systems, and importantly, our genetic services are state-based and currently state-funded. Uh, and really, we need to make sure that we are one country of 20, a cohort of 25 million people to make this work. And that also makes us much more um, prominent and much more valuable on the world stage because we can link in as a country in a meaningful way. Now, Australian genomics, um, which has sort of really kicked off for real in 2016, has been built on a lot of state-based initiatives, which we now link together and make sure we have complementary interactions between the states. We have investment in the different states, as we did here, first up with Melbourne genomics. Um, but what we're aiming to do is to make sure that we don't end up with a railway system with the different rail gauges, that we're actually using standards that can be shared around the laboratories. We're piloting the way of sharing data. Um, we've got standard policies, practices, ethics, consent, and we're really engaging our patients and our public as we go along. So Australian Genomics was um, funded commencing in 2016, $5 million a year for five years. And it really is a health services research project. It's about 
um, demonstrating patient benefit, cost effectiveness, and practical strategies for implementing genomics into our healthcare system. Um, but at the same time, making sure that we're feeding into our, our wonderful research. Because really, if we do all the known genes in the healthcare system, then we've got enriched cohorts for gene discovery and for research. And we certainly are getting much more information to flow through for drug targets. Australian Genomics is a partnership of 78 generally well-behaved institutions around the country, um, but we also link in with national infrastructure, our international partners that I've talked about, and the peak professional bodies in genetics and pathology. Um, our overall plan, and I'm not going to do a deep dive into Australian genomics, but it's just to give you a feel, is that um, we're really driving by taking patients as they come into clinic right here, right now. It's not going back to the fridge and sequencing what's there. It's seeing a patient in clinic and enrolling them prospectively. So this is a learning research model. We're setting up national diagnostic and research networks. We're looking at how and piloting how we federate um, data and make it available for analysis and appropriate sharing of data. We're assessing cost effectiveness. We're working with government and with MSAC to get Medicare numbers um, and clinical utility cards for different genomic tests. We're training our workforce and we're paying very special attention to the ethical issues that will arise. As we start to move this, I mean, when you're giving the best test to the patient for the situation, there's not a lot of ethical argument about that. There's a lot of black and white here about where this is the best thing for the patient. But it's really as we start to think about prevent prevention, about reproductive carrier screening, about things that we sort of do but do it on a single gene basis, that's where we really need to bring our community along in the discussion. So importantly, um, as we've set this up, um, and someone said to me they thought this was worth $25 million, is we've set up ethics and governance with a joint national ethics framework and a common clinical and research consent around the country, now in over 30 um, institutions. And that of itself took a couple of people full time two years to do. We really need to improve our ethics and governance system. Melbourne Genomics, I'm just going to give some hard examples from this, because a number of you have been experienced with this. But it's really, as an example, we're using what we've learnt here, and we share it widely around the country in terms of what works and what doesn't. And Melbourne Genomics is now, with our state government's involvement, has established a statewide um, platform so that we're really um, integrating genomics into our healthcare system, evaluating it, but then sharing what we find. And the starting project um, was really, it was perspective, uh, and it was looking across a whole different range of disorders. But comparing that standard care, and think about that patient I told you about with that long workup for a neuromuscular disease, versus imagine if we'd had genomic sequencing available when ELISA first presented in 2005, and how different the course of that family may have been. We really are succeeding in these shared approaches across a whole different range of areas in terms of data standards. And even just within the Melbourne genomics over the last couple of years, we've probably already trained over 250 clinical champions that are now genomic literate physicians and clinicians um, that can, can also train others in terms of how we use this appropriately and effectively. We've set up models for how we share data. You know, if we can share data between the Children's and the Royal Melbourne, then we can share it with Sydney Children's and we can share it with the Broad Institute. Um, it's really just, it's, it's, we can grow as long as we work out how to do it right in the first place. Two slides of evidence and then I'll finish because this shows the promise of where we are now. From the Melbourne Genomics um, Project, I think it was important that we really assessed how the patients felt about this as part of their diagnostic workup. Um, we don't, you know, you need to bring people along with you. They need to understand what we're doing, what the test means. And in Melbourne Genomics, 96% of patients consented for the test. 99% agreed for their data to be used for research because they could see the value of data sharing. And we went back to those patients a year later 
and they were still happy with that and they felt that they had been formed adequately to make that decision. It wasn't something that was made in the rush of the moment. This is the most important slide. I think you should turn around. This is for patients presenting. Like, think of Eliza in the ICU, likely genetic disorder, unable to breathe. How do we speed through this diagnosis? So these are the sort of patients that we're looking at. And when we looked at our standard approaches, ye oldie diagnostic flowchart, the diagnostic yield was 11%, and the cost per diagnosis was over $27,000 and a lot of time in hospital. In the same group of patients, we did genomic sequencing um, with a targeted analysis. And we then did a cost analysis of what it would have cost if we'd put it in appropriately into their clinical, um, into their clinical care. And we made diagnosis in 58%. This is the same group of patients. And the calculated cost, the model cost per diagnosis would be $6,000. So obviously, this is what we showcase to government as the value of this, particularly for this group of patients. 18 months later, and this is actually the slide that I think affects me, the part of the slide that affects me the most, is that now we've got, you know, about 58% of these families have a diagnosis and they now have choices about their reproduction and prediction for pregnancy so that they can go ahead and choose to have a normal child. In those families that had a diagnosis, 18 months later, this was the number of pregnancies. And in those who didn't have a diagnosis, there was one. So this, for these families, is restoring reproductive confidence and, and the way that they can think about having a child with the peace of mind that it won't happen again. And I think this is incredibly important. So then the boring stuff. We work with government. Um, this National Health Genomics Policy Framework um, I spoke to at COAG, which is a meeting of the state and federal health ministers, the week before last, and now this has been approved as a partnership, as a state-federal partnership, for how genomics will be implemented around the country. Of course, the devil is in the detail, but this is a great start because it has um, a, an agreement by the state and the federal government that they need to work together on this so that we can be a true cohort of 25 million people. And this, don't read this, but this is just showing Australian genomics has now evolved so that with the flagship diseases that we're looking at and across all of these different areas, we have working groups now that are focused on all of the different parts of that genomics framework, um, particularly things like, and things as they arise, such as insurance discrimination, for example, how are we going to solve these issues? So it's been a big time of growth in this area. We now have over 230 investigators around the country, um, and uh, now we're up to 80 partner institutions. There's a lot more engagement as it goes forward, um, and it's going a lot, it's going better than I would have predicted. But we remain hooked into the world, and I think Australia is actually, because We've taken the hard way and we've started with things like Melbourne Genomics and really look at how we embed this into our healthcare system that um, is, is really quite unique around the world. Um, and we're now working with a lot of other countries. Genomics England actually wants to use our evaluation protocols um, to look at how they can get genomics into the NHS. And this is, is now my role um, within the Global Alliance is actually looking at how we bring all the national initiatives together. And we've had two meetings to date, bringing together almost 20 countries, where we really look at how we develop the interoperability, not just between <coughs> states, but between countries, um, and really share best practice. And the established initiatives are then helping the less established initiatives and also the third world countries um, as they're developing their approaches to genomic medicine. Back to Francis Collins was at the um, 2017 launch that was just two weeks ago of the next phase of the Global Alliance. And Harold Varmus, who's just been here, um, was there as well. And really, they're launching this phase, um, next phase that I've talked about with great support. Really looking into the future, you know, this is looking at, you know, 30,000 patients in 2017 have had their genome se sequence for a rare disease diagnosis. By 2030, it's going to be 36 million. We need to make sure that we're using all of this information to the best of our ability. 
So the Global Alliance, the way we're enacting this is by having real world driver projects that are using standards and testing sharing in real time. And I'm very proud to say that Australian genomics is actually part of that. And here we see we had a, um, we've got three countries involved. This is Sue Hill, who's the head of the uh, NHS in terms of implementing genomics in Genomics England into the NHS. Um, David Glazer, who's from Verily, who's one of the data leads for the Precision Medicine Initiative in the US. Um, myself and um, Heidi Rem from the Broad Institute. And now we have our countries cross-talking together to make sure our data is interoperable. So it's been a wild ride. Um, it's very exciting, and I, I think the, the most of the work is probably ahead of us. Um, but uh, I must say, I don't think I could have um, been as involved in this genomics or have made it happen um, or been involved with um, this quite so deeply if it hadn't been for the collegiality and the support um, of all of my colleagues here in Melbourne because uh, we got together with Melbourne Genomics and then um, we banded together when it came to putting together a national bid um, for leading a national project. Uh, and so I think uh, it, it's really been a great team effort, um, and for that I'm very, very grateful. Thank you.